There's a couple of gems in here. Welcome back, Troglodytes, to your daily dose of guitar information, the Trogly's Guitar Show. Heritage just released their latest auction preview for a whole bunch of guitars. So things for you to keep in mind, bidding starts July 24th. The auction ends August 11th. There's a 25% buyer's premium on top of your bid, and it's located in Dallas, Texas if you want to join them. Let's start with the ones that stood out to me. Starting things fresh, we've got that Jimmy Page Vibe 1960 Les Paul Custom. It's got the Bigsby, the ABR1, the three triple PAFs. It looks like you're running your ground wire from your bridge pickup to the Bigsby. And Heritage is saying that they believe this to be a factory Bigsby model, and they couldn't really quite explain that. Fair enough, at least they disclosed it. But it's got some beautiful aging. But honestly, I only showed you this one as a comparison point to the next guitar that we need to check out. Do you happen to see anything different about this one? At first I just thought it was another Black Beauty, but then I saw it. It's a Mickey Baker model. I haven't actually seen one of these things show up for sale. True vintage in style, I knew they existed because I documented the 90s reissue, which you can check out in this episode. But these borrowed the ES5 layout. Sometimes these are called the master tone because you have a master tone selection right here instead of a toggle switch. And then it utilizes three volume controls for the bridge, middle, and neck pickup. It solves the common issue that you normally find on a three pickup Black Beauty. Well, some people call it an issue, but bridge position is just a bridge pickup, neck is just your neck, and then the middle is a combination of your middle and bridge pickup that gives you kind of a single coil-esque tone. I personally love that, but other guys want more control, and that's exactly what the Mickey Baker setup gives ya. So it looks like we're missing a little bit of binding right here. I've never seen a vintage one, so I don't know if they normally had that poker chip or not. Unfortunately, one of the volume tones has been sank through the top and is in need of repair. Got some sort of a scuff mark right here. Did somebody put a MIDI on that? And yeah, it's gonna need some TLC. But I am excited to see what one of these things sells for. I certainly would not mind having the Mickey Baker model in my collection, the true vintage one, or at least to document it. There's not too many weird, quirky, limited edition Les Pauls from the 50s because they were just starting out. That's why you're kind of limited to custom colors or the weird doofy tenor models. But this next one, brace yourselves, guys. This is the reason I had to make this video. Holy cow. <laughs> it's so terrible and doofy looking, but I love it. And it's from 1992. The early 90s period of Gibson is great. This is technically before the opening of the custom shop that we think of today. But it's a Les Paul with a Super 400 neck. But it's got so much space here, something has had to have happened to our scale length. Now, according to the description, it's a 25 and a half. But wouldn't that be a lot of fun if it was a baritone like 27 to 28? but it's got the full-on Super 400 neck with the apropos inlays. You got the multi, 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 multi layers of binding. You've got that obnoxiously gaudy giant headstock. And then we got the flip out crank winding tuners on it just for extra fun. An ABR1 bridge, so it's kind of a prehistoric. But then you flip it over to the back here. We've got our usual binding, but a heel cap. You don't normally see that on a Les Paul. But then we've got a Stinger, a Custom Shop Edition, which means there might be more than one of these things out there. And then of course you're gonna have the additional inlays. And if that's enough, uh, Carlos Santana signed it. That's kind of cool, but honestly, this guitar is just so strange. I'm really curious what this is gonna bid to because it's either going to be crazy because everybody wants the weird Les Paul or very low because nobody wants the dumb looking Les Paul. But trust me, I would love to give that a good loving home. But wow, 10 and a half pounds. And they say possible overspray to the body. So what that means to me is somebody has likely oversprayed the signature so it won't wear away. Next up, a 1983 Spotlight Special. While the Super 400 is what made me record this episode, what tipped me off to this auction was actually Brian here saying, hey, I know you like these spotlights. Here's one for sale. And I've got to say, out of all the spotlights I've seen, this is one of the uglier antique naturals. But to be fair, these things never really look good in stock photos that have white backgrounds. Like, you can tell it's got some flame figuring, but it's not the craziest one we've ever seen. I actually really like the wood grain underneath it, and you've got very tight grain in the center walnut stripe. If you need to learn about ANT spotlight specials, check this episode out. But they have brown binding with an additional cream layer on the fretboard, too. That's what makes them a little bit more fancy than the antique sunburst versions. But then the head stock on this one looks way lighter than most of the other ones. The other ones are pretty bright too, but this one seems even lighter than that. But it appears to be pretty clean on the back. Still has the original tuners and it is serial number 132. But uh oh, COA not included. 
Don't worry guys, the COAs were not part of those guitars. I'm really excited to see what one of these will sell for at an open auction, because that's usually the best way to tell, is the market going up on these or lower? You want to look at the no reserve auctions. The next one to catch my attention was a 2002 Les Paul Faded. So if you don't know about those, you can check out my review and documentation. Before they brought it back recently, these things were very famous for being modified because they are able to breathe. Whether you believe it or not, satin finished guitars do have a different vibe to them than full gloss, so people gravitated towards them. This is a particularly nice top for one of those. And as we all know now, it's been greeny modified. Upside down neck pickup, whether they reverse the magnets or not, we don't know at this time, but they did the iconic knob modification. But oh, I thought 2002 sounded strange. If I remember correctly, that model didn't come out until 2005, because only the first two years had non-weight relief, and that's why people go for them. And then 07 started the chambering. And looking at our serial number, it is a 2007. We were just talking about quirky vintage models. Here's another way you can go if it's not tenor. You can go three quarter size student models. Man, I hope one day a Les Paul Custom shows up as a three quarter size. I'm sure it's out there. There had to be at least one rich dude that had a really promising offspring. And he's like, I need the best of the best, but they need it a little smaller. But being the freaky fish shaped 65 Melody Maker style <laughs> doesn't help this one's case. There's a signature Joan Jett Blackhearts Melody Maker coming up. Might have to watch this. I had a beautiful minty new old stock one. I don't know why I sold that. I should have kept it. But it's one of those few reissues of the 65 Melody Maker. Next, we've got a couple of famous guitars. So this is Elvis Presley circa 1968 prototype Fender Rosewood Telecaster. Now, this thing was actually on Reverb not too long ago. Reverb even wrote an article on it late 2022. But SS Vintage in Chicago ended the listing. So now I think we know why, because they're putting it on the formal auction block. Honestly, something like this, it's probably the better place to put it, but we'll have to see what it ends up bidding for. It's just nice to have some really high resolution shots of it before it joins the Ursae collection. But if Elvis isn't your style, what about Kurt Cobain signing a 66 Jaguar? Looks like this one's been modified for humbuckers and maybe a few other things. I thought that was pretty fascinating. And oh, nice. When it comes to sign stuff, if you have a photo of them with the iconic guitar, especially if they're no longer with us, that is golden and makes the piece even better. But here's Trent Reznor of Nine Inch Nails smashed Gibson Studio. Wow, they kept that all the way from 1994, eh? But it was smashed on stage and then signed. For being smashed, it doesn't look to be in that bad a condition. Wah. Oh, spoke too soon. <laughs> and it doesn't seem like you get the headstock either. But now this was interesting to see, a multi-artist signed 81 Sonics. Come to think of it, I think the Silver Sonics is a very rare finish for this particular model. Not that it sells for crazy premiums or anything, but this is actually factory stock. So the original plastic has stayed on this thing for so long, no artist decided to be a rebel and sign the plastic instead of the guitar. Oh, you did get one guy. I had to be like, I'm signing the neck. But what happened to that? I would like to say stand rash, but that is the worst case of that that I have ever seen. But hey, this is nice. It looks like we even got some photos of the people that signed it. Unfortunately, nobody looked familiar to me, but maybe you can help us all out in the comment section and try to make some sense of all of these. And hey, if you want a 90 studio, here's one signed by Les Paul from 92 in the white finish. And it's got the awesome ebony fretboard. Just need your frets desperately cleaned. Unfortunately, the signature is a little bit blurry. There's a 1998 Les Paul Standard that was apparently Paul McCartney's. I feel like they just had something like this. It was an 80s Les Paul Custom at their last big auction. And oh, how unfortunate. <laughs> it's taken from the back both times. Okay, there we go. We can see it from the front this time. Next up, we've got a The V. This is kind of a quirky model that I haven't had the opportunity to document yet. And it's not that they're necessarily hard to find. I'm just looking for a particularly attractive one that's very clean. And this one's got the diamond posi lock buttons. That's cool. It's got the top adjust bridge. For whatever reason, most of these are obnoxiously long in the tailpiece department. Looks like uh, at least one or two replaced knobs on this one. But we've got our original double cream dirty finger pickups. But that's why they haven't called it a The V because somebody has replaced our truss ride cover on it for some reason. But whoa, we got the original plastic on the back plate. That's right, these are all maple bodied guitars. Same thing goes with the neck, that's got some decent figuring within it. But ah, oh, that's a shame we don't have flip out winding tuners on this. It has almost every single fancy part. But that's from 82. 
It also had one of those weird Futuras in the pearl white finish. So it's the Corvus set neck version. You can check out these videos if you need to learn more. But it's one of the ultra crazy ones with the factory Kaler. But this is not a flat white finish. It is pearl white, so it will have a light sparkly effect to it in person. The 62 SG Junior kind of looks janky, but good at the same time. We clearly need to clean up the pickups a bit, but you've got the 80s Gibson Schaller made wrap tail piece that we've seen on models like the Corvus and the map guitars. Somebody's clearly filled in some holes over here from a vintage trim. The whole headstock just looks off. Like, doesn't this look wider than normal? Perhaps it's just because the nuts off its rocker. And then, oh, um, you gotta love vintage repairs. That looks like some sort of a metal plate that they secured it all together with. So maybe that's not the original top headstock piece. Who knows? Could be a fun project. But speaking of fun projects, they called this one a 61 Gibson SG. And when I saw that, I went, what kind of mod collection weirdo stuff is this? Factory no pick guard? Nope, just refinished. Don't get too excited. Serial number is illegible under a thick poly finish. But hey, hear me out. Now you can get a vintage SG for like half the price. Honestly, it'd probably be worth it to send it down to historic makeovers and have them do it up real nice. But we still got the three golden humbuckers. Looks like we've got some pretty good pickups in there. Cool looking headstock. And if it's been refinished, you know there's gotta be a repair at the heel or the neck or maybe even in both places. So those were my top picks from this new heritage auction. There's a lot of crazy stuff, but I do have an eclectic taste for my own collection. So let's go ahead and go through some of the other stuff that's still pretty cool too. Here's a 65 335, a 1960 ES 355, a 1977 Gibson Johnny Smith with the doofy mini humbuckers. And of course you can't not have a stinger back here, but what does that say? Johnny Smith. I was expecting promotional not for resale or something. A 47 350P. Ooh. That's a nice neck, especially on that side. Gotta love ES-295s. An L7 arch top with a bird's eye back, cool. And of course a stinger with Grover Imperials. Then we got a 58 350T. Whoa, what did they do there? Wow, is that what I think it is? Is it a brass floating bridge? I have never seen that. It's only ever been wood. Most times it's a wooden bridge up here too, but sometimes you'll get metal. But I've never seen the actual bridge portion like that. That's kind of cool. What if it gives you better sustain? That's got some cool figuring on the back too. But check out this weird L12. I don't think I've seen something exactly like this. Very plain arch top, kind of a reddish brown color. Split parallelogram inlays. But I'm talking about that headstock. It's almost religious looking. Maybe we need to bring it back as a limited edition on a Les Paul Custom. This is a 1948 Gibson acoustic. Cool double pick guards with a worn vibe from the banner years. Holy cow. That's quite the wear on the neck. Here's a Roy Smack signature guitar. It's got some pretty interesting inlays that you don't see a lot used in today's production, except for maybe that one has snuck its way in a few times. Then we have a couple of Greg Rich art guitars. Of the two, I think this one appeals to me more. Here's a blonde 69 Tele with Fender branded Bigsby with a really dark looking natural Jaguar from 65, listed as very restorable with a stripped finish. This one's kind of interesting. A Stevie Ray Vaughan backstage pass slapped onto a guitar that is apparently a parts caster. Here's a Jimmy and Stevie Ray Vaughan signed guitar. That's a great combination. And being an 89 Strat, that's not too bad either. And of course they have a vintage Electric 12. And one lone Squire guitar, the Teleacoustic, signed by Mr. King. But check out this 63 Jazz Bass. Yes, it's been modified, it's been refinished, but I feel like the Fender Custom Shop could make some of these and sell it. I love that all blacked out headstock matched with this wood grain and some of its primitive designs. Three knobs, output jack. This one was clearly loved by someone. There's a quirky Bass 5 coming up for sale. It's just fun, but I don't have anything else to really add to it other than that. There's a beautiful 74 Precision Bass. Got a lot of nice wood grain to it in the ash body. And oh, that's interesting. We've got a double I formation over here. This 1960 bass definitely has a vibe. A doofy looking Mustang bass. If you're into the Beach Boys, they signed this 2012 Fender bass. And a 71 Jazz bass. All right, troglodytes, I hope you enjoyed tonight's episode. I'm looking forward to this auction. I hope I can win that doofy Les Paul custom that probably nobody wants. Here's hoping we'll see it in a couple of months. All right, take care. If you enjoyed tonight's episode, consider subscribing. I post videos like this every day. And you might even enjoy this next one.